Hello. Today I'm going to show you a digital audio format from the early 1980s whose influence is still with us today. It was the capabilities of this format which dictated the technical parameters of the CD and then some of the parameters still used in today's digital audio files. In the early days of digital audio there was no practical way to store and transmit large digital files on computers. So the early digital masters for CDs were supplied on modified versions of the popular pneumatic professional video cassette format. These large tapes. The video signal was replaced with patterns on the screen as you can see here. These patterns are a digital code which have the same parameters as those used to master a CD. These machines were then used in recording studios and for other editing and mastering processes. So there were still a number of these uh, pneumatic tapes in existence, sometimes with otherwise long lost recordings on them. So it is important that some of these machines are preserved in working order. The format started with a model PCM1600 from Sony, which I don't have an example of here, but I think it was fairly quickly updated with this one, the PCM1610. This could be connected to any NTSC pneumatic video recorder, but there was a machine that was specially designed uh, to give slightly better results. Here I'm using it with a normal pneumatic uh, deck. It's a multi-standard one which can play NTSC tapes, and you can see here that it works well. However, the format was a bit fragile. Any tape dropouts will cause a popping sound in the digital audio. It's quite similar to the bubbles you will have heard on DAB radio. Don't get me started on DAB in the UK, it's horrible. There is error correction built into the format, but it's not always effective. So Sony made some changes and developed a special player and decoder set which would read the tape twice with two heads on the video drum and use the data from the two passes to help with the CRC error correction process. For this to work, there are now two video cables connected from a DMR4000 pneumatic player to the PCM1630 decoder which supports this new RAR feature, read and read. Sony claimed that this eliminated errors due to tape dropouts. Well it didn't, not by a long way. And my impression is that old tapes don't seem to play noticeably better on the PCM1630 than they would on the 1610. I suppose a tape dropout is still a tape dropout even if you go over it with a second head. We'll come back to dropout errors later. There's another problem, which has more to do with the pneumatic side of things and the decoder used. A particular brand of tape was often used for these recordings. Ampex. <laughs> Ampex tape uh, makes the heart sink of anyone who's involved in the tape preservation business. It's a very well documented problem how Ampex branded tapes suffer from an effect called sticky shed. In short, the tape sticks to the inside of the player and the cassette and sheds oxide onto the heads and the tape path as it goes along. There is a process called tape baking uh, where you can bake in a tape affected at 50 Celsius for some hours which will often but not always make the tape stable enough to play. Even after extensive baking though, some tapes remain sticky. Now that would be bad enough, but there's a bit of a design feature on some of the pneumatic decks, including the DMR4000 which can become badly snarled up with a sticky tape. Let me show you the unlace and eject operation. That's all fine, but let us just do that again and stop it for a moment. There's a guide on the left of the deck which relies on smooth operation of the tape in order to get itself into the correct position. I have found that this guide can get out of the correct sequence if a sticky tape grabs the guide at the wrong moment. Not only does the tape then become stuck, but even if the tape is extracted, the machine will still not work. I can't demonstrate the exact issue with this working deck, but it can involve manual operation uh, of the unla unlacing and getting this guide correctly located again. I wonder how many pneumatic decks have been scrapped over the years for this issue which isn't that hard to fix when you examine what's going on. Now we've looked at the PCM1610 and 1630 decoders here. It's worth mentioning that there was a similar digital audio recording format usually known as PCMF1 and usually recorded on Betamax tapes. Decoder models included the Sony PCM-F1, 
PCM501, 601 and 701 and you may have seen me demonstrate this format on previous videos. If not, please do look them up on my channel. The pattern of data encoded uh, as video for the PCMF1 format is similar but incompatible with the UMATIC version. One of my previous videos shows me debugging the SPDIF digital output modification for the PCMF1 format. This modification allows us to take a pure digital output from the decoder, bypassing the digital to analog converters and so getting a more precise transcription of the tape's digital audio data. The PCM1610 and 1630 decoders also have digital outputs installed, but it's an old digital format called SDIF. Instead of stereo audio coming from a single SPDIF connector, there are three outputs, one for each channel plus a clock signal. This is completely incompatible with a familiar SPDIF or the closely related professional version called AES-EBU. There was an optional panel for the PCM1630 which replaced the left audio output channel with an AES-EBU digital output, but it's virtually unobtainable today. There were some uh, digital converter units made by other companies which could go from the SDIF signals to the SPDIF or AES-EBU, but these two seem to be virtually impossible to obtain. So at the moment, I still do not have a pure digital route for the PCM1610 1630 format. Please let me know in the comments if anyone has any solutions to this that they would be uh, willing to part with. There was another decoder for use with UMATIC called the PCM100. My understanding is the recordings made on the PCM100 will play on the PCM1630 but not the other way around. I don't have any PCM100 recordings and don't particularly feel like making any up but I thought it would be an interesting experiment to see what happens if you try to play the PCM1610-1630 recordings on the PCM100. Will it play anything at all? Do anything at all with the signal or just ignore it? Here it goes. You will see that the LCD VU meter on this PCM100 has gone a bit strange but it won't stop us from doing a test. The result? Silence. No, alas, the PCM100 completely ignores the PCM1610-1630 format signals. Oh well, it was worth a try. I'll throw the PCM100 back into my storeroom. There is one more piece of kit I'd like to show you. I'll confess I don't yet fully know how to work this unit, but the DTA2000 was designed to help log tape errors. You could connect a parallel port printer, remember those, and it would print a log of the errors it found on the tape at the time of the recordings. It was something of an admission of guilt by Sony that the format was insufficiently robust. I've often had one of these printouts in with UMATIC PCM tapes showing the time code locations of the tape errors on a recording when it was made. Add about 35 years of worth of tape degradation to the mix and you can imagine how many tape errors there are now. I hope you've learned something from this demonstration of the uh, UMATIC PCM digital audio equipment. Um, it's pretty rare equipment today, so uh, it's uh, nice to get it out and share it with, with the YouTube community. Now, please do like, share and especially subscribe uh, so I can do more YouTube content on uh, audio and video technology in the future. Bye for now. Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas!